Hey everybody, it's Royal Surf Gamer back here with a top 5 countdown for my favorite Nintendo Switch indie titles that came out in 2018 that are still worth playing today. Not only did they have to come out in 2018 on the Switch, but they also had to come out in 2018 in general. So my favorite game from last year that was an independent release came out in 2017 on the PC, 2018 on the Switch, so it's not eligible for this countdown, but I did put it in honorable mentions because it's my favorite game from last year. So I'll put all of the eShop um, links in the description so you can read up more about these games if you're interested in that. Also, I reviewed one of the games back last year in either January or February. I'm going to put that link in the description, and I'm just going to let you get to the countdown. So without further ado, here we go. Number 5. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon is a nice little game that pays homage to Castlevania from way back on the original NES. If you are an 80s or 90s kid, you'll see a lot of parallels between Curse of the Moon and Castlevania, such as whipping lanterns to gain powers, and those annoying little knockbacks when you get hit, which by the way you can turn off in the options menu. The first couple of screens in the game are almost exact replicas of Castlevania, to be exact. The way Curse of the Moon expands on the old Konami formula is to include a cast of characters, each with their own powers. You can switch freely between each character, choosing the one that best fits the scenario on the screen. Do you need to fly? Just pick Gabble the Vampire, turn into a bat to reach that ledge. Need a ranged weapon or to slide? Turn to Miriam the Heroine. And just like in Castlevania, there are a slew of special weapons unique to each character. Old favorites like the Boomerang and Holy Water are back, but the Alchemist adds a couple of cool spells like the Fire Shield and the Ice Crystal that really turn the tables. There are a couple of things I really like about this game too. Characters don't share health bars, so if one character is about to die, you can just press L or R to switch those characters quickly. Additionally, you don't lose a life until all of the characters in your party die, which can be helpful. Especially if you need all four characters at full health to take down the boss, you could just kill the last one, start at the checkpoint, and get back up pretty quickly. I also thought it was clever how these little dead skeletons pointed the fastest way to get to the level boss. Pretty clever. While sometimes I couldn't get to the door or the stairwell because my flying character was dead or I needed a certain power-up, it sure was nice to know which fork in the road was the best. As with any game, Curse of the Moon has its flaws. First, it's a terribly short game. I reached the final boss in less than two hours, which is about the same amount of time it takes to beat the original Castlevania from way back on the NES. You can repeat the game on higher difficulties, though, and explore the branching paths. Another downfall is the controls. I know they made the controls similar to Castlevania on purpose, but the jumping is just way too stiff nowadays, and it's really imprecise. Sometimes I died on jumps less because of skill, but more because I wasn't lined up perfectly before a jump or I hadn't pressed the button soon enough. This made the final level of the game almost unfair to play, as some of the platforming requires intense precision. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon definitely scratches that platformer itch and is worth playing for sure. But if you want a true Metroidvania instead of a platformer, wait for Summer of 2019 when its sequel, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, comes to Switch. It promises to have a map twice as big as critically acclaimed Castlevania Symphony of the Nights did, and it will deliver more of a haunting, exploratory experience. Number 4 Another platformer that harkens back to the NES age is The Messenger, an adventure with a Ninja Gaiden feel. While Ninja Gaiden was specifically a platformer only, The Messenger is more of an adventure game. Sure, it has all of the sticking to walls and throwing stars and an Asian theme and these extremely retro level cuts. There is much more beyond that. See, there's this really modern feel to The Messenger, even though it looks and sounds like an 8 or 16-bit game. Think about the messengers being Ninja Gaiden mixed with Shovel Knight. For example, there's this weird shop owner that sells you powers from a skill tree for crystals, and that's a pretty modern concept. There are save points, which most NES platformers didn't have. There's an actual story with nice depth also missing from Ninja Gaiden. And there's this little bug that saves you from death, but then you have to pay him a crystal fee as you traverse the level, a mechanic similar to those lanterns in Shovel Knight. There are also these hidden alcoves with collectible coins. And if you find all of them, you get, as the game calls it, an overpowered weapon. This leads to one of my two favorite things in the game, which is the game's sense of humor. The game breaks the fourth wall by talking about itself all this time, saying stuff like, Oh, the room outside was symmetrical, so you thought there would be a boss fight? Or, I don't have any tips about the area boss. It's a new boss to the area. This adds a lot of flavor to the game, I think. Also, the shopkeeper has these cute, funny stories, one for each level, which leads to banter between he and the main character. The other thing I really like is how nice the character feels when I control him. If I die from falling in a pit, it's definitely my fault, not the control scheme. 
Also, a cool surprise happens partway into the game, and I'm not going to spoil it for you. As for the negatives, I don't have many, if anything. I found the game a little bit too easy, but that just might be my 1980s gamer mind speaking here. The bosses have a very distinct pattern, which is a trope of the old 1980s and early 1990s games, but I think that's one trope that should have died with the decade. Though the flashing of the boss as sprite does make me chuckle a little bit, it brings back memories of spending handfuls of quarters in arcade machines. And although the chiptunes are awesome, I don't feel like they always give the level I'm playing a deeper feel. They're just like great pieces of background music. The messenger gets all the pieces of platforming correct and sprinkles humor and tropes throughout, sometimes going a little bit overboard. As far as a spiritual successor to Ninja Gaiden mixed with Shovel Knight, it does both justice. Number 3 For a completely different type of game, we turn to Into the Breach, a dystopian turn-based strategy game. And if you're into strategy or tactics games, you can think of Into the Breach as maybe a Fire Emblem or Final Fantasy Tactics type game, but on a much smaller scale. Bugs are taking over the planet, and you're basically the last hope to stop them. There are quite a few different objectives to conquer in each continent, each giving out its own rewards. The interesting catch to this game is, though, that all the quests are interconnected. What this means is, if you do a really poor job on a level, it affects the rest of the continent until you finish the final boss. The gameplay is consistent and very good. There are regular enemies, stronger enemies, and then enemies that buff other enemies. And you have to play the game carefully, because if you lose a named character, they're dead forever, and there are only three of them. Named characters level up, but once a named character is killed, then a robot just takes over as pilot of the mech, and only the machine can be upgraded. But if you don't take enough damage by, let's say, getting the way of a ranged attack, then cities could be attacked and you lose power. Too much power loss on a continent means game over, though, so you'll have to really balance between the cities getting attacked and your pilots getting attacked. There is one specific mechanic in this game that makes it much different from other tactics games that I've played. Learning knockback and adjacency is essential to winning. Sometimes the best way to kill an enemy is to get it into a place where you can knock it back into another enemy, into a mountain, or into some fire. This will weaken the enemy even more, and maybe even kill it. Best case scenario, you knock it into water. And why is this good? Well, because water automatically kills those nasty buggers. Your mechs also take damage if they get knocked into, so you have to be very careful about that. As for adjacency, make sure that if you use an exploding weapon, you know its range. Otherwise, you might not damage what you want to damage, or you might not do the damage you want to the stuff you want to damage. As for some other pros and cons, I think the difficulty settings are accurate and essential to your experience. Please start on easy. As a grizzled veteran of tactics games, even I had trouble with normal at first. Another pro is how slowly you build your stats and mechs. Usually this would be a con, but it really feels awesome to get a new power-up. Because it's almost like upgrading your car. Since power-ups are so few and far between, it really feels special to get. Some of the cons for me are the graphics and sound. They're just kind of bland and don't add a whole ton to the game. If you played this game without sound, it wouldn't really make a difference, unlike some other games on this list. And also, if you play for too long or you play too often, some of the tasks can get monotonous. Oh boy, I have to save the power buildings or protect this parcel of land again. There are a lot of these types of quests. The fun of Into the Breach is really just in pulverizing those little suckers into the ground and becoming stronger. The tactics and gameplay far outweigh the audio and the visuals. If you want a bunch of bite-sized missions revolving around a dystopia theme, then this game is a great bet. If you want something bigger, try recently released Wargroove, a game that borrows from Advanced Wars. And if you want a really giant game, Fire Emblem Three Houses will be here in the summer. But until then, Into the Breach is definitely a great strategy tactic game that is worth picking up. Number 2 I was warned about Dead Cells. I was told that once you play it, you'll try one more run, then one more run, and then just one more run. And sure enough, that's how this game is. You sit down for a 20 to 30 minute run, and then it turns into 40 minutes to an hour, I just had to have that one extra run. In case you haven't heard about it already, Dead Cells is a procedurally generated Metroidvania roguelike. Try saying that a bunch of times fast. I haven't beaten the game yet, but I think the idea is just to get out of the prison? Just like many roguelikes, you start off with the basics. Sword and shield, or sword and bow. And each time you find a new item in the dungeon, it can be collected, and maybe with your permanent power-ups, you'll be gifted it at the next playthrough. The name of the game, Dead Cells, comes from the souls you collect from the beings you kill. You take these cells to a collector who is found in between areas of the castle, or prison, or wherever you actually are. 
once you get enough, you get a permanent upgrade, which of course is the best type of upgrade because you get to keep it when you die, unlike collected cells, weapons, and items, which just vanish into the ether when you die. The gameplay is basic, just don't die. Kill things by using your main weapons like a sword, hammer, or bow, or use your sub weapons like bombs or this weird spinning flesh grater. It's powerful, but it's also weird and gross. Most procedurally generated games and roguelikes are usually not metroidvanias, the styles don't go together, but Dead Cells pulls it off by giving you these weird upgrades. In some of the first runs of the game you find this strange moss that you can quote unquote tickle. Well if you get far enough in your first run or your second run or maybe even your third run, you get an upgrade that allows you to tickle this moss, and when you tickle the moss it turns into crawling vines you can climb. The game is smart enough so that when it procedurally generates, if you find that little patch of moss or the vines or whatever in the first area of the game, you go into a different level called the Toxic Sewers instead of going onto the Promenade of the Condemned. Who knows which path is better, you're going to die several times no matter which path you take. The art really pops on screen, the colors are beautiful, the sound fits each area exceedingly well, and I have no qualms with the controls. Other than for some reason I keep pressing the sub weapon button when I want to roll, I don't even know how I got those mixed up. Some people are going to get really frustrated with this game, but those that stick around with it will be rewarded with a tiny little piece of the pie that'll keep them coming back for one more run. Just one more run. In fact, I think the subheading on Nintendo's website sums it up best. Use your alchemic abilities to escape the island in this brutally challenging 2D action platformer with no checkpoints. Here's my favorite part. You'll get better, eventually. And by the way, this game's going to be getting free DLC on March 28th, so if you haven't picked it up, or if you have, look for that DLC too. Honorable Mentions Unfortunately, Hollow Knight has to be in the Honorable Mention category because it actually came out in 2017 on PC and 2018 on Switch, so technically it doesn't fit the criteria of the video. However, I implore you to buy this game, it's so good. This was my favorite game released in 2018 on Switch. I liked it better than Smash, I liked it better than Pokemon, I liked it more than Octopath Traveler. I like the idea of Metroidvanias, which Hollow Knight is one of those, more than I like the games themselves usually, until I played this game. Every night before bed last summer I would sit down for two hours and explore all the little secrets of the game, and sometimes I would spend two hours running around to find a new place to explore, then I would just wait till the next night to explore it. Sometimes it was an hour fighting the same boss over and over again because I didn't have the right upgrade for the knife and I just kept dying. Then school got in the way and I haven't finished the game, though I'm pretty close to finishing. I think what made me play this game obsessively is basically two reasons. First, the game does a great job of making you feel like you're part of the game. I was playing it in the dark, in the middle of the night basically, and I strongly recommend playing it in the dark as well. And it makes each stage have its own feel. The beginning area, the Forgotten Crossroads, feels damp and somehow cracking at the same time. The colors are very gray, purplish gray. In the City of Tears, it's raining and the sound effects are awesome. The atmosphere is a depressing blue. Then in Green Path, everything is green, vibrant, and alive. All the subtlety in visuals is similarly found in the sound as the rustling of the leaves or an explosion isn't just there as a basic sound effect. It really feels like it's an experience of the night, which is so amazing to behold. The other reason I kept playing is that for every 30 to 45 minutes I spent with the game, it rewarded me. I would get an item, or buy something new, or defeat a boss. There was always a lingering question, what's next? What's behind that boss? What's that item going to unlock? And then, either later that night or the next night, I would hunt for the next thing. The wall I could break, or the, the gap I could now fly across. And sometimes you'd have to traverse across the whole map to find it. Which brings me to the game's only downfall, the fast travel and death system. See, the fast travel system doesn't come into play for a few hours, so you have to platform a lot of the same parts of the game several times. There's a vertical section in the Forgotten Crossroads, which I must have gone up and down three or four dozen times. When you do get fast travel, it's much better, but then you might die. And when you die, your soul basically steals all of your geo, which is your currency, and it sits where you died. Your money might not be a big deal, but then if you don't release your soul, you can only charge your soul meter, think magic meter, two-thirds of the way. And if you have extra meters after the first one, you can't charge those. So you literally might have to take ten minutes hunting down your soul just to get your money back and continue the game with your full power. There are other little touches in the game that I love too, like you can't see yourself on the map screen unless you have a special item equipped, which is really cool because why would you know where you are on a map if you haven't even begun to draw the map? And also you can't really map out the areas you explore. You buy the map from a cartographer. If you have 25 to 35 hours to put into a game, this is the game I really suggest you get it. 
And if you love it as much as I do, a second game in the series, Silk Song, which follows a different character named Hornet, is slated to be released soon. So if you enjoy your adventures with Hollow Knight as much as I did, you'll really be ready for that. Number one. I reviewed Celeste back when it first came out last January. Links in the description. I was skeptical of the 10 out of 10 score that IGN gave the game, and after playing a couple hours of it, I gave it my own review. After finishing Celeste and clearing some of the extra content, I stand by my review of the game. It's a solid 9 out of 10. Celeste is a puzzle platformer, not really an adventure platformer like a lot of people say. It's just a very, very good puzzle game. Unlike many games, dying is fine in this game. Each room is just a big puzzle for you to cross, either by using your powers, which you get stronger along the way, or by using other gadgets in the room to help. The gadgets might be something like a diamond that allows you to dash again, and some of the powers would be like this dash through these jello blocks from stage two, which I really like a lot. When you die, it just takes a mere second to revive and you try it again, and you're gonna die a lot, sometimes hundreds of times in a level, and that's fine because it's seriously gratifying when you reach the safety ledge. I'm gonna let this clip play, and I'll tell you that this screen took me more than a half hour to clear the first time I played the game. Finishing that was pure elation, and that's not even the hardest screen in the game by a long shot. Some of the screens, especially on the B-sides or what is really hard mode, you have to have pixel perfect jumps to finish. At first I panned the controls, but then I realized it was more about the Switch's D-pad on the Pro Controller. If you play this game, use the Joy-Cons and grip, or play handheld because believe me, Pro Controller D-pad is not the way to go, and the stick is not quite specific enough to get you where you want to go. The only gripe I really have about this game is the story and adventure part. I know what the story is about. People have told me, oh you just don't get the story. I do get the story. It just didn't grab me. I didn't really care about any of the characters. Madeline, the main character, included. And many of the characters in the game really just frankly annoyed me. The only thing I really cared about was the puzzle part. How do you get to the next screen? In this top 5 I've talked a lot about sound and graphics in the game. And the graphics in Celeste are very very good, very pixelated. I believe it's an 8-bit style, very good, but the sound is unbelievable. The compositions really stick with me, like this song, and this song, which is from the first stage. It could probably just play in the background of my life, and I don't think I would ever get tired of it. So the one Switch 2018 indie released last year that is most worth playing is Celeste. I mean, it did win Indie Game of the Year last year at the Video Game Awards for a reason. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Let me know what you think down in the comments. I hope you enjoyed the video. Also, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. I'm going to put up uh, in some video links to... Celeste, which was the number one video, and so you can go look at that review if you want. I'll put up, um, I don't know, maybe a Pokemon Let's Go video because that's the series I'm working on right now. Click my face in the bottom right-hand corner to subscribe, and also don't forget to click that bell for notifications. Thanks again for watching this Top 5 Indies video countdown from 2018. I'm Real Serp Gamer, and I'll see you next time. Bye!